The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. I'm Doug Jones. Today I'm going to visit with Kim Hachia and Craig Chandler, who authored this exciting new beautiful book about the 150th year history of the University of Nebraska, our university. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and just a reminder that the Lincoln Children's Zoo is not just for children. It's for people of all ages. And John Chapo, the executive director and CEO, is with us today, and we're going to take a look at the year-round open now Lincoln Children's Zoo. Hello, I'm Jerry Renault. One of the concerns always about growing older is loss of muscle mass and muscle strength. We want to show you today how you can help prevent that or at least make life a little bit better for yourself. We have a fabulous guest, Dr. Joel Kramer from the University of Nebraska, who is here to tell you how you can live a better life. You don't want to miss it. Opioids, are they really necessary for you? Please stay tuned as we hear from pain management specialist, Dr. Kelly Zock, on opioid use among the senior population. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Welcome to Live and Learn. To celebrate the 150th anniversary of the University of Nebraska, the University published a commemorative book called Dear Old Nebraska U. I'm Doug Jose, and pleased today to have the authors of that book, Kim Hachia, who did the text, and Craig Chandler, who was responsible for the photographs. And first of all, Kim, uh, how did this all come about? Well, apparently in about 2017, the university knew its 150th anniversary was coming up, so they developed a small steering committee, and the idea of a commemorative book was kind of launched during that period. And then, um, then they had a committee that Craig was on, and I was invited to the committee to talk about um, sort of concepts for the book and come up with some topics. And then in the fall, or the January-ish of 2018, I was contracted to provide the content, the word content, and Craig is um, photography director at the university's communications department, and he um, was in charge of wrangling up the photos, many of which he took himself, and many are historic from the university's archives. Take us back then, uh, first of all, to the 150 years ago on February the 15th, uh, and really what happened then? How how did this all come about well, in terms of the university being formed? Um, the university was, um, because of the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, when the university became a state in 1867, they just, so the founding people decided to take advantage of that Morrill Act. And so in 1869, they, um, the legislature unanimously passed the original charter. And that same day, the first governor of the state of Nebraska, um, David Butler, signed the bill. And part of the land grant act said that they had to have a building and have their doors open within two years or they would lose the money. And so they um, efforted really hard and they got that building open and they, uh, and they opened in a couple of years later with 130 students of which only 20 were in the university. The other 110 were part of the Latin preparatory school because we didn't have high schools or anything then so a lot of people just really weren't up to the academic speed to do um, collegiate level work. So the, the state be, became a state in 1867, so, so it was really the Moral Act that was the incentive uh, behind forming the university? It, partly, but I also think just the, I think it was partly just the idea that a state had a university and the people of Nebraska have always been proud and you know, we value education and we wanted to be one of those states that had a proud university. We, our charter was in some ways modeled after um, other existing state universities, um, particularly University of Michigan, that's always been a, one of our aspirational universities, and the um, University of Minnesota, our charter very much um, apparently um, owes a lot to that, to Minnesota's charter. And those are two, you know, they're our Big Ten colleagues now, and right. we, um, you know, we're proud to be part of that group. Well, the first chancellor, um, Alan Benton mm -hmm. became chancellor in 1871, which was the year that students were first, first admitted. admitted. But he, he had a fairly big influence on sort of the vision and right. future of the university. Yes, Alan Benton, um, he did sort of set, kind of set the tone. He, um, his, one of his main things that we remember him for is he developed the official university seal. And um, 
so, which has little um, icons of things that he thought the university should be doing. And um, so each thing, like the little shock of wheat, is supposed to represent the agriculture. Sure? And the train, I think, represents engineering. Um, I don't remember what quite all of the other things do. The, obviously, the palette and the painters, the arts. And our university has always been, although the Land Grant Act specifically states that you're supposed to focus on um, education for agriculture purposes, um, Nebraska has always been a little bit more expansive in that and looked at things. So we have um, a somewhat unusual amalgam where rather than having the state university and the other university like Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa, Iowa State, we have one university that focuses on sort of comprehensive things. Craig, uh, it's, it's a beautiful book and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved with it. Well, they asked me to be part of the committee and to dig up the pictures we needed and shoot the ones we didn't have yet. So um, Special Collections in the Love Library has all of our history. Uh, it's almost an Indiana Jones, very well kept basement down there of cool stuff. So they have some awesome librarians who dug out oh, probably over a thousand images for us digitally to choose and look at. And from there, just as the committee, we, we made lists of what we wanted to have in the book, uh, topics, you know, the colleges and hit the big stuff, athletics. And so it was a matter of then just kind of pulling what we had and seeing where we were and then filling in some gaps for um, what we'd like to have in the book also. So it was a vision, uh, obviously, to, to try to transmit that in, in pictures, what happened in the last 150 years? A, a combination of where we've been in our history and visually, because it's hard to do in writing, visually a little bit of aspirational, just kind of to put, put some wow into the book so that when people hopefully open it, they say, wow, I, didn't, you know, I haven't been there for 10 years or 20 years. I haven't seen that before. And uh, just to kind of, you know, make some people proud of the place. The picture we're showing here now uh, first was uh, Lincoln as it looked when, when the first building came up. So it was, you might say, well, what, was there enough uh, background here or enough uh, support in this town to support a university? But it's amazing. Yeah, I've I've been at the university now for ten years, and it's amazing to see that picture and and to see a huge, solid building when everything else is about a one-story wood frame house. I mean, that, that's a lot of vision and that's a lot of courage to build something like that. And from there to uh, convocation in uh, New Pinnacle Bay. Yeah, that. That was fun um, to see it that full because that many students on the on the floor graduating and continuing the traditions and and then the support they're ringed by their support of parents and family and friends and and so that I love commencement those are just you can't go wrong there's a lot of joy that day yeah, yeah. last year what we graduated five thousand students between them all yes yeah and the first commencement they graduated five so. You can, and the first commencement I think was in 1874, so you can really tell that they, you know, we've grown a lot. That's right. And in growing, uh, I look at the, the chapters, and I think you have neat titles for each of the chapters in the book, but how, how did that come about? How, how were those selected? Well, the University of Nebraska Press, which is the publisher, and the editors kind of came up with the chapter titles, but we, um, the original set of, of uh, items that we were wanting to include sort of, you know, they were grouped like alumni, um, faculty, students, so those kind of things. So then they kind of embellished on the names. We also, we wanted to make sure that the book sort of was comprehensive about the entire university and um, a lot of, there's, there's a lot about athletics in the book, but we are more than an athletic university. And so um, athletics is just, is a small portion of there's a lot about research. Um, well, I think there's a, a real focus on students. I, uh, right, and I, which I that was important to me because students really are the heart of the, heart of the university. Um, faculty are extremely important, <laughs> but if we didn't have students who wouldn't have any. Fa we wouldn't even need faculty, and so the whole aspect of student life was interesting to me because when we started, they didn't really care about student life. There weren't any residence halls. Um, 
the students just sort of showed up and listened to the faculty and that was the end of it. And then when um, Charles Bessie came, he kind of sort of changed the direction of how the university and how education worked. That it was more of a collaborative effort and students were required to do field work. And, and, we've, and so we've just built on that. And research is an important part. It informs the teaching, informs our learning. And so and we've, Nebraska does research in some really amazing areas that you would not you would not right. guess. I mean, we have this amazing laser project that's the light of a billion suns or something like that. And so it, we've, we are more than just a regional university that focuses on just one thing. We are very comprehensive with a wide focus. One of the chapters I'd like to touch on here is the, the one on legends and legacies. And you know, out of the 290,000 plus graduates that there have been, how, how did you choose to, to uh, highlight 10, 10 of those? Well, some of the legends and legacies you are kind of obvious, right, Craig? I mean, obviously, Johnny Carson. Yeah, we have and, a picture of his. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Johnny Carson is, is you know, we revere that guy. Um, Willa Cather, obviously, a, a major, major writer for the 20th century. Um, other people are less well known. Um, my personal favorite is a lady named Gladys Henry Rowena Dick, who with her husband in 1924 developed a vaccine for scarlet fever. And um, I mean, that was a terrible scourge of a disease, but she and her husband developed this vaccine for it. So, you know, there was all these interesting little stories that just kept sort of kept uncovering yeah, and, and finding. And as, you, as I read through those, uh, it's interesting, some of the issues that people already on addressed, you know, are, are still with us in some form. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's different right. maybe, but it's sort of the some of the same issues that are yeah. still with us. And we've always hung our hat on, on agriculture research. And um, because we're an agriculture state and we're a land grant university, but one of the, the very first extension publication was about irrigation. And, um, and now we have the Water for Food Institute. So it's just, there's these through lines that run through the university that, um, you know, we started 150 years ago looking at X, Y, and Z, and we're still interested in that. Is this the legacy of Kim Uchi and Greg Chandler, or what, what's the legacy of this book? <laughs> I'd say not. I, I still have quite a few years to, I tell people behind every door is something amazing on campus, and I've still got a lot of doors to open and a lot of pictures to take. So maybe it'll be a, a supplement like any yearbook would have. Yeah, that'd be cool. I don't know, I, I, I don't know if it's a legacy or not. It was a real privilege to be asked to write the book and to uh, be able to be part of the project. I have real strong Husker bona fides. My grandparents and my parents and my brother and my cousin and my uncle, all, many, many people in my family have attended the university. And uh, so it's a point of pride to be asked to, to contribute to the university's 150th celebration. How do people like get a copy of the book? It's um, University of Nebraska Press has published the book and so you can order it directly from them online. Um, it's also at lots of bookstores in Lincoln. Um, it's at the university's bookstore in the basement of the Nebraska Union and um, other bookstores around town. It is a beautiful book and we encourage people thanks. to uh, get a copy. Thanks, it was fun to write. And, and thanks for being with us. Yeah, it's, you're uh, welcome. really uh, interesting. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn about your university, the University of Nebraska. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake. And how long has it been since you have been to the Lincoln Children's Zoo? Wait until you see the changes. John Chapo is the CEO and president of the Lincoln Children's Zoo. We welcome you. I know you've had been there for a long time. Now, we want to go back and a little bit of the history of Absolutely. the zoo. Absolutely. Now, um, it, 
Arnold Folsom was the first one to begin. Would you explain it and when it began? Yep. 1959, Arnold Folsom had a dream. So 60 years ago, Arnett said, I want to bring a children's zoo to Lincoln. The children in Lincoln need a great experience to encounter animals. And so Arnett Folsom became just, he just became consumed by the fact that the children in Lincoln needed the opportunity to meet animals close up and nose to nose. Well, what about, what was the mission, his original mission? His mission is the same mission we have today. Oh. To, to enrich lives through first-hand interaction with living things. He always wanted kids to meet animals, pet animals, in a beautiful landscape setting. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted kids riding ponies, feeding the goats, and all kinds of great stuff. Okay, now Arnett Folsom in 19... 59. 1959. Oh. 60 years ago. He was, a, he was a Boy Scout leader. He was a business leader. You know, he was, just, like I said, he was consumed. And as my understanding, if you saw Arnett Folsom walking down the street, you ran to the other side because he didn't care how rich or how poor you were. <laughs> he was going to ask you for a donation to create that children's zoo in Lincoln. Exactly. Okay, now what's new at the zoo? Oh, all kinds of things oh, that are new at the zoo. What's, what's really important, though, is that we have stayed true to Arnett's mission of engaging kids. And so for years, then it, they, they've been able to ride ponies and feed the ghosts and have butterflies light on their fingers. Well, what's new at the zoo now is all kinds of great bigger animals at the zoo because we've gotten just a little bit bigger. Now you can come to the zoo and feed giraffes. Can imagine feeding the <laughs> tallest animal in the world. And that's Joey. And Joey's going to be getting up to 18 feet tall. Oh. And kids, year-round, no matter what time of year, they can either feed the giraffes inside or outside in the feeding deck. Well, so that's exciting. Thing it's going to be awesome. And, the, and it's open year-round. Yeah, thank My you. Goodness. Exactly. Which, which we've always been a seasonal zoo. When yeah. the zoo first opened, it was Memorial Day to Labor Day. And then it was totally empty. Now we're going to go year-round for the kids. Okay. Now... The entrance, even the entrance, has expanded. It has expanded, Leader. You're absolutely right. We've gone back to A Street, okay? So we got a big, fancy new entrance that clearly marks where it is. And so you can come in. You can even see it at night all lit up. So that's just it. We're back to the A Street entrance. We were there A Street when the zoo opened up. Then we went to 27th Street. And now we're back to A. You're back to A Street. Yes, and so that's a huge area. What, what, what's the whole total? Well, the whole total of the zoo now is about 14 acres. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, it started at four acres, but it's, but it's still great. It's still engagement. We're still one of the smallest zoos in the country. Okay. Oh. Yeah, it, for acre size, but we run more people through acre of the zoo than any other zoo in the country because we're a great, rich experience. And it's open year round. Year round. I mean, that yeah. is so marvelous. Yeah. You can see the tigers year round. You can feed the giraffes year round. You can see the red pandas year round, <laughs> and so many other things on a year round basis. And you've uh, expanded the entrance. We have. The entrance is really great. It's going to make it a lot easier. And we have handicap parking right near the entrance, too, Lita. It's going to make it a perfect area, so it's very, very convenient. You, you, you park, and within 20 feet, you're within the zoo. And as soon as you walk in the zoo, the red pandas are walking overhead. <laughs> it's only red panda exhibit with a log overhead <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> so it's really an awesome experience. All right, we want to look at some of the animals. Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, the new ones and some, the, what, what about some of the old ones? You know, the, the iconic animals at the zoo have always been, you know, feeding the goats. Mm -hmm. And kids love to feed their goats. I don't care how old you are or how young you are, you know, feeding the goats is something that is just, you know, that's just Look a, at that darling it, little child. And we still have those the, classic <laughs> opportunities. You know, that was, you know, over 50 years ago, that child. And, that, and that's the wonder. Look at the wonder in that face. Uh -huh. And that's what kids still get when they come to the Lincoln Children's Zoo is that wonder. <laughs> it's a lot and, of fun. and the giraffe has been around. The big, big giraffe big has been around for a long time. Well, the big, well, I mean, the giraffe just arrived this year. Okay, oh. so the giraffes just arrived this year. Uh, so they're, they're brand new to the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Oh. So we're really excited about them. That's when the youngsters, and they're growing up and getting taller. And sooner, before you know it, they're going to be 15, 16, 17, 18 feet tall. Exactly. Well, how do you feed? How do you feed the giraffe? Uh, <laughs> you don't <laughs> need a carefully. ladder. You don't need a ladder. You know, the zoo's <laughs> designed specifically so the kids' feet are eight feet above the giraffe's feet, okay? So you're up on an elevated deck, and then you just get your leaf of lettuce, and those tongues, you know, 18 inches long oh. come out, and those big necks come down, and so it's just a phenomenal... You know, I've been doing zoo work now for 46 years, and I still love feeding giraffes. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And how do you feed the monkeys? Uh, <laughs> well, you you don't, you don't get to feed the monkeys, but you get to climb the, with the monkeys. 
We're going to have the kids climbing. Remember the but old you have to feed the monkeys. Well, the zookeepers have to feed the monkeys. Uh -huh. Exactly. The zookeeper special diet. But the old historic zoo building that was built by the WPA in 1936, mm. the Children's Zoo is renovating that space. Okay. And so a lot of people may remember the old spitting monkey. That well, was <laughs> I was just going to, because that, that monkey spit at me many years I, ago. Well, and he, he was not making an editorial about you. He spit at everybody. Okay, Lita. But now we brought monkeys back to that building and we got climbing and kids will be able to climb with rare black faced spider monkeys 20 feet up in the air. Kids will be climbing with the monkeys. There will be glass between the kids oh, and the so monkeys. Oh, so if the monkey spits at you, then you're not going to get You're not going to get wet. Oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's going to be safe for the kids, fun for the kids. It's going to be a great year-round experience. I mean, literally, kids climbing way up in the air. It, it's going to be the most unique zoo experience, I think, in the country. <laughs> and then the tigers yes the sumatran tigers oh boy oh tell us we, we about have, we you, have, did you have to go to sumatra to get no them? we didn't they were actually like all the zoo animals are born at other zoos okay these oh. our tigers actually came from the san diego safari park okay and we have Sum, uh, we have kumar and axel they're three and a half and three years old they're beautiful brothers and they're you know the the, the sumatran tiger is the rarest tiger species in the world maybe four or five hundred exist in the wild they're, ex they're critically endangered. So the Children's Zoo has teamed up with about a, a dozen other zoos to help save the Sumatran tiger from extinction. Well, well how much space do you need for uh, an animal that you know, it's got to roam? And uh, that's a very you know. good question, Lita. We have built a huge brand new facility. It's got a big outdoor yard. It's got 5,000 5, square feet outside. It's got a waterfall. It's got a stream. Because tigers love water. It's got a special cave that's heated in the wintertime and cooled in the summertime. And what's really great is that the kids get into a share a Jeep with the tigers. The tigers are on one half of the Jeep, the kids are in the other half. But there's a two inch pane of glass between the kids and, uh -huh. and the tigers. So it's, it's safe for the kids when they get in with the tigers. So, and then they have three great big bedrooms and other outdoor spaces. So we have built one of the premier tiger facilities in the country for our very, very Sumatran tigers at the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Oh, I'm Zoo. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, w what do you consider the most unique animal <laughs> at the Lincoln Children's Zoo? Well, there's a lot of very unique animals that I'm very lucky to see on, on a regular basis. But probably Probably one of the strangest and most unique is the tamandua. Uh, Isn't that a, to say that again? <laughs> tamandua. Tamandua. The tamandua. On the road to Mandua. On the road to Tamandua. <laughs> there you go. You you can make a song out of the word tamandua, Lita. Uh, they they're also known as lesser anteaters or an arboreal tree dwelling anteater. That long nose has like a. Uh, almost a two-foot tongue that comes out of very long and skinny that's great at eating termites and ants okay and they got big claws for climbing trees and ripping trees apart to it, get to the insects and, and they have prehensile tails so they're great for climbing in the rainforest and they're just a fascinating fascinating this is Eden Eden is a is a brand new tamandua at the Lincoln Children's Zoo and so we're really ex excited to have her there I'd like to get one of those at home and get rid of <laughs> some of the, my, the ants <laughs> well this is the time of year the ants are kind of moving in because yeah. Yeah, starting to move around, you know. So yeah, yeah. our little tamandua can be pretty <laughs> helpful. Uh, but the tamandua needs about nine thousand ants a day. Have you got that many? I think so. <laughs> 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 yeah, so they're just fascinating creatures with those long noses and those long sticky tongues. Okay, now do you need senior volunteers? That's what we're all about. We always need volunteers. The Lincoln Children's Zoo, you know, serves our communities only because of the great people. And we have hundreds of volunteers, hundreds of youth and a lot of adult volunteers. So if you want a volunteer at the zoo, call Jordan Slagle at the zoo at 402-475-6741. And her direct extension is 129. Or you can email her at jschlagle at lincolnzoo.org. So we got great opportunities for adults. For age people, what, 50 something and older? And absolutely. You know, we got some great, we got some great folks who are engineering the train. Imagine oh, oh, yeah. blowing the whistle oh, oh, and oh, having yeah. hundred, hundreds of happy kids. Or maybe you're a gardener and you can help in our garden because we got, we got two great horticulturists on staff and they're professionals and they could always use great volunteers. Okay. What do the volunteers do? Well, you know, they, they help weed the gardens, they help prune the plants, they, do, they help plant the plants, they help blow those train whistles. They may even help in the office, okay? Or maybe even help chop up food at the zoo to help serve the animals. Now, the, the guys, are the guys who run the train? Uh, ladies can also. Oh, ladies. We, oh, have, you we can... have lady engineers, exactly. Oh, excellent. Oh, we're, we're totally liberated at the Lincoln Children's <laughs> Zoo. Exactly.
in fact. So yeah, we, we and you know, sometimes it's even fun for couples. You know, one to engineer, because we always need two people on the train, one up front engineering, the other one keep doing the safety and, and back. So it's great for couples too who want to volunteer at the zoo. <laughs> exactly, so we got lots of opportunities. Okay, if, if somebody wants to volunteer, they're interested in, uh, uh, who, who do they call? Call Jordan at the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Jordan okay. Schlegel is a wonderful a young lady who just, she's enthusiastic about the zoo. She helps make things happen at the zoo because we got a great team of folks who are called Jordan Schlegel at the Lincoln Children's Zoo at 402-475-6741 and her direct extension is 129. Get a hold of Jordan. She'll love to talk to you. You didn't even have to look at the teleprompter <laughs> in order to read it. You just, <laughs> that came out of your mouth. You've been there so long. Now, how long has it been? 33 years, Lita. 33 years and counting. Yeah, you know, I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska 33 years ago just for a couple, three years, because who wants to live in Lincoln, Nebraska? <laughs> Lincoln's an awesome community. I love the Children's Zoo. I love Lincoln. Tracy and I fell in love. We've got three great sons uh, that have grown up here. So Lincoln's our community. Well, we're certainly glad that you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what's the most unusual thing that has happened to you during those 33 years oh, at the zoo? The most unusual, you know, is probably when I've been on live TV and I had an animal bite me and I start to bleed and I kind of got a, <laughs> you know, so that's happened. Or, or, you know what animals do besides bite, they also have stuff come out the other end. Oh, yeah. I, I was standing talking to 500 kids once in a school auditorium with a great big lizard and the lizard just kind of, all over me not once twice in front of five. and the kids just kind of went oh but i kept on talking i kept on educating them because <laughs> you know with animals you can never plan how do you clean up lizard uh, with <laughs> it very carefully and with a lot of mops and a, and a lot of disinfectant yeah uh, for you since you've been around for a long yeah. time what is your most uh, favorite animal Oh boy, Lena, that's such a hard question. You know, I, I'm because I'm amazed every day. You know, I'm a tortoise guy. My nickname when I was a kid was Turtle John because I I always had turtles and tortoises, and I love the Galapagos tortoises at the zoo that came in the size of a tennis ball, but now the Galapagos tortoises are they're 50 pounds on their way oh to becoming 400 pounds in the next hundred years. <laughs> and the marvelous thing is the great great grandchildren of Arnett Folsom. That's right now come to the zoo. Exactly, that, and that's what warms my heart. You know, Arnett's granddaughter was a teenager when, the zoo, when Grandpa was working on the zoo, and she now brings her granddaughters, and she says, John, you're doing exactly what Grandpa wanted. Oh, you're good. keeping Grandpa's vision and mission yeah. alive, and that's what's important to me, connecting those kids, and five generations of, of Folsom's, that's the way it should be. <laughs> and remember, the zoo is open all year round now. Isn't that marvelous? Exactly. Oh, what a gift to Lincoln. Our it thanks is. to you, John Chapel, for being there for 33 years and, My and pleasure. carrying the torch for the you, Lincoln you Children's got it. Zoo. Lita, you know what? I'll right. see you at the zoo. You <laughs> Remember, it's never too or late to live and learn more about the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Wouldn't it be nice as we get older that we can continue to do all of the things that we've been doing throughout our life and be able to do them successfully? Sometimes that doesn't always work out. As we all get a little older, we have issues with muscle mass and muscle strength, and that uh, sometimes can't be avoided. But in other, ways, in other kinds of <laughs> situations, it can be avoided. And so we have a guest today, Dr. Joel Kramer, who is with us from the University of Nebraska. And he has been doing some research into this particular area, and he is going to help us all live better lives as we get a little, little older. Joel, thanks for being with us thanks today. Thanks for having me, Jay. Uh, before we get started into this uh, situation that <laughs> we're all gonna be going through, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, when we talked earlier, you're uh, from that part of the state that um, I've actually spent some time in, in Stromsburg. How did you get interested in this particular area and subject? <clears throat> well, like many Nebraskans, I, I grew up on a farm, a small town kid and uh, involved in sports and uh, when I was in high school, I started out a little bit overweight, 
And I realized if I lost a little of that unhealthy weight and I gained a little strength, I could perform sports a lot better. So I was hooked from that point forward. Uh, so I, I went to Creighton University. I got my bachelor's degree in exercise science. Uh, then came to the University of Nebraska and got my master's and PhD in exercise physiology and hooked ever since. Very good. All right, let's talk about the situation because this is something that is almost inevitable for everybody as we as we get a little older but there are some things that we can do so uh, but let's talk about this what are some of the uh, symptoms sort of some of the things that people can look for uh, to think that they're starting to perhaps have a, an issue right well muscle strength um, obviously peaks around the 20s and 30s uh, our, our age is there so uh, after muscle strength peaks it tends to decrease over age. Everybody is aware of that. Um, so what I study and what we look at by definition is sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the age-related loss of muscle mass. Um, and it's not just muscle mass, it's also strength and function. So uh, the study of sarcopenia is primarily how we would define it and what we look at in my lab. Uh, it's a terrible sounding name, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, what would be some of the symptoms? I mean, if, if somebody uh, getting up uh, in their 60s, late 60s, early 70s, and is there something that they could look for or that would notice that they would go, oh, you know, maybe I need to make some changes? Yes. Uh, the age-related loss of muscle strength occurs quicker than muscle mass. Muscle mass doesn't fall off as quick. So... Uh, Signs and symptoms of age-related loss of muscle strength is maybe it's harder to get out of a chair. Maybe it's harder to get out of a car. Uh, walking up and down stairs might become a little slower. Uh, opening a jar of pickles. All of those things are activities of daily living. And when the quality of life is affected by our inability to do activities of daily living, we try to remedy that by lessen, lessening the effects of sarcopenia. Later in, in more advanced stages of sarcopenia, you do see changes in muscle size that are visible, um, changes in muscle tone. Maybe muscles are a little bit softer. Uh, so those are the, the things that we can see and feel and things that affect our daily life. Tell us a little bit about your research because you are very involved <coughs> in looking for uh, some ways and some things that, that, that people can do. So tell us a little bit of, about the kind of research that, uh, that you're doing. I've been to your, your shop and it all looks very <laughs> uh, complicated and uh, space age. Lots of wires. Yes. Well, it, it all comes down to studying uh, muscle form and function. We are interested in uh, how we get stronger, why we get stronger. Uh, that can occur from uh, natural increases in strength during growth and development. It can occur by uh, us doing experimental interventions in the lab um, in middle-aged and, and young adults to see how exercise and nutrition may affect muscle strength and muscle strength changes. <clears throat> we also look pr primarily at how muscle strength declines with older adults. And that is a pressing issue. It's an immediate issue the numbers of older adults are, will increase substantially over the next three or four decades. Um, we're living longer. We want the quality of life to be better. And so our research is focused on maintaining that muscle strength uh, during those later years and seeing if we can um, delay those effects of sarcopenia. Right. Okay. So let's talk about what it is that we can do, or at least what the current research is showing us. And uh, it will come... As no surprise, I'm guaranteed uh, to anybody in the audience that uh, it's the two big things that we always talk about uh, in health, and that is getting exercise and diet and nutrition. So, and those are the two key things here. Um, again, it's the positive outlook uh, for sarcopenia, exercise and nutrition. Well, to start, um, most, I think most people would default towards nutrition at first, and um, protein is a big factor in maintaining muscle strength. Protein is the building block of muscle. So how can we increase protein in the diet? Uh, most research has shown that older adults tend to get most of their protein in in the evening hours. So eating protein it, at dinner um, and not breakfast and lunch may not be optimal for maintaining muscle, muscle size and strength. Uh, 
our, our research and research from other labs, Dr. Phil Atherton has done a fantastic job of looking at um, basically how regular meals with protein and regular doses of protein can improve or maintain muscle mass. So getting about 25 grams of protein in at breakfast, 25 grams of protein in at lunch, and 25 grams of protein at dinner um, is impactful. It helps maintain uh, that muscle mass. And it's not just the quantity of protein, it can also be the quality of protein. In general, animal-based proteins are complete proteins, and plant-based proteins are incomplete proteins. They're missing an amino acid. So even though it would be best to maintain uh, proteins with branch-chain amino acids, like uh, eggs, um, dairy, meat, those types of proteins would be the best. But for vegetarians, it can be combined plant proteins to make up for the deficit of another plant protein, like beans and rice. Yeah. Um, is a way to complement or complementary protein. Yeah, we have a, a list of some of the, uh, the of, of protein tips. So we, we talk about cheese and eggs with salad and Greek yogurt and smoothies with milk and yogurt and then and peanut butter. But, uh, and this is always when we had this conversation, so I think this is fun. What if you are somebody who high cholesterol? So you're going, well, I shouldn't have those eggs. Uh, how do I deal with that? Um, lots of people will say uh, cheese is, is not good for you. You shouldn't have a lot of cheese or you shouldn't have a lot of red meat. That's, uh, again, a really good uh, uh, way for protein. And there are other diets that are very heavy in fiber. And I guarantee you there will be people in our audience that will go, I'm supposed to be on, on high fiber. That is right. also supposed to be helpful for people who have high cholesterol. How do we balance? all of this, um, because I gotta tell you, I think it's tough to get 25 grams of protein in the morning. It is, it's difficult. Uh, eggs and cholesterol, hotly debated topic. Yeah. Um, there's research that comes out all the time. Sometimes it says, well, the cholesterol, because the cholesterol that we get in an egg is in the yolk. That's where we find the fat and the cholesterol in, in an egg. Um, the protein that we get pr predominantly is the egg white. So separating out the, the egg yolk from the egg white is one way. It's one approach. Um, most of the literature would suggest that the cholesterol in an egg isn't that detrimental. But if you are on a doctor prescribed diet that um, you need to reduce your cholesterol intake, um, one way to do is separate the yolk out. Okay. All right, very good. All right, we, I think we had a shot of, the, of, the, of a sample um, <coughs> uh, one day diet plan. Let's, uh, let's just sort of uh, drift through this quickly and uh, give people an idea of what it would take to get that kind of protein during the course of a day. And I think people are going to look at this and go, that looks like a lot of food. It does. Uh, when you look at this, you see a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and in between you see two snacks. Um, it's obviously modifiable. It's one example. Uh, but at breakfast, you see the two eggs. Right. You see milk, and you see pr uh, peanut butter. That will be where the protein exists in those foods. Uh, peanut butter is plant-based, so the highest quality protein in breakfast will be in the eggs and the milk. Um, th together, that will be about 25 grams of protein, okay. with all things considered. But notice that you have whole wheat toast, so you're, you're going to get your fiber and your grains in there. Okay. Um, so you've got the balance uh, with the peanut butter, the banana for fruit. Um, there are, uh, it's balanced such that those things are, are able to, is it possible to get those things in every single day and have everything look the same? Well, no, and it can vary, and varying a diet right. is good too. Uh, but those meats, uh, dairy, um, the chicken breast is another great example of, of a high quality protein that has those branch chain amino acids in it to maintain muscle size and strength. Okay, so uh, lots of protein. Um, we're, we're all good there. Uh, let's talk about the exercise a little bit because there are, um, I, again, I, I think it will be uh, not a surprise to anyone that we're looking at the seven to 10,000 uh, steps a day. Um, seems like it should be easy, but it's, it's not. But there are different kinds of exercises that are helpful for um, sarcopenia, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> exercise is the driver. I mean, good nutrition, um, is a long-term, has long-term benefits, health consequences, um, but to see profound changes in strength, 
uh, resistance exercise is, is where it's at. Uh, we can see profound changes in strength and even muscle size in older age, even in two or three months of a structured resistance training program. And this doesn't have to be, I mean, heavy weight lifting. It can be maybe the bands or something like it that? It can be cans of food. Oh, okay. Uh, could you imagine uh, at home with cans of food lifting them above your head or pressing them while laying down? Those, those types of resistance training exercises are lifting weight. And our body responds to lifting weight by increasing strength and mass. And they are profound changes. Um, and with the diet included, um, obviously the, the benefits are the best. Cardiovascular exercise, walking is one of the best exercises. Walking, um, like you said, seven to 10,000 steps a day. That might be 30 to 45 minutes of walking in addition to the steps you would take on a normal day. Uh, for structured cardiovascular exercise would be, it's helpful and it's not just helpful for um, uh, our typical cardiovascular uh, endurance benefits. Muscle strength in the legs, uh, make, keeping those legs moving, blood flow in the legs. Um, we can have the fa fanciest diet in the world, but if our blood flow to skeletal muscles isn't very well maintained, uh, then we can't get the nutrients to the muscles where they need to go. So we're looking at about 150 minutes a week would be if, you, if you're looking at walking. Yes. Okay, very good. All right, before we run out of time, you are conducting some research and you are <coughs> looking for um, some help. Uh, tell us just a little bit about that. Yes, uh, my lab is currently, we, we've, we've conducted a number of studies and with protein and exercise, we think we have our recommendations down pretty well. It's carbohydrates that we've focused on recently and I think the trend toward uh, studying exercise and nutrition in older adults and metabolism has gotten to be um, quite popular. So we're conducting a study in my lab on metabolic flexibility. Um, how older adults respond to eating carbohydrates and sugars. Uh, we are recruiting for that study right now. We are looking for older adults that may have low grip strength. They may walk slowly. They may, um, they can't be currently diabetic, but um, that help would be very useful for us to be able to disseminate our results and say, well, um, yes, sugars, added sugars are bad, but here's how they're bad. This is what happens. Here's how they store in the body if, if eaten by older adults. So looking at their resting metabolism would be uh, very helpful. And so this study um, that we are conducting, we're really struggling to find those last few subjects, uh, but hopefully, okay. Uh, hopefully we can. We'll see if we can help you. And there is, it actually is a little money involved. And if somebody ha has uh, some questions, um, they saw the phone number, they can uh, call and, uh, and get some more information. Thank you. Dr. Joel Kramer, thank you so much for being with us today. It has been helpful. Always good to have some knowledge about how we can live better lives. Thank you very much for having me. Love this part of my job. And thank all of you for tuning in today. I'm your host, Jerry Renault, And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Are you 55 or older, low income and need a job? The Senior Community Service Employment Program offers employment assistance to low income Nebraskans age 55 and older, offering paid training at local organizations to update your job skills and build confidence, while preparing skilled, experienced and responsible older workers for today's workforce. The program also helps local agencies increase their services and operations. My topic today is an important one, as it deals with opioid use among the senior population. I'm Kristen Stowes, and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Kelly Zock, who is currently serving as Medical Director of Bryan Health's Pain Management and Opioid Stewardship Program. Thank you for being on Live and Learn, Dr. Zog. Thank you for having me, Kristen. I'm so happy to have you. After obtaining your medical degree in anesthesiology, you continued with a fellowship in interventional pain medicine. With this career focus, what medical conditions bring a patient into your office? Sure, so we see a breadth of different p chronic pain conditions. So really anyone that has pain from their head down to their toe. Um, the most common uh, conditions that we see are spine related conditions, so neck pain, uh, back pain, we also see patients with joint pain, uh, really a variety of chronic pain conditions uh, bring various different uh, uh, patients to our clinic. Okay, all right, I understand. Part of your therapy includes the use of drugs, including opioids, but I understand that is not your first or only means of helping a patient control their pain. What other therapies might you begin with? 
Right, so opioids now are kind of more of the later line treatments for, for uh, pain management. Okay. Um, really what we focus on now is a multidisciplinary and comprehensive approach to managing pain. So we do a lot of injections, spine related injections, joint injections. We also kind of serve as air traffic controllers <laughs> to find the, the, the correct physical therapy program for patients, uh, send patients to chiropractors, uh, acupuncture, and even offer uh, medical nutrition and dietary advice for, for patients to, to manage their pain. So it's really a multidisciplinary approach. It is. It yes. Is. Yes. Not not one thing works for everyone. Right. And, yes. and, and that has we found that to be the the, the best the mm -hmm. best way to manage pain. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree. In what situations are the use of opioids indicated and most effective? Yeah. So opioids are most effective for those acute pain conditions. And so these are the. The, the types of pain, this is the type of pain that occurs after a surgery or after some kind of trauma. Um, really pain that lasts for a relatively short duration of time, less than several months. Oh. That's when the opioids are most effective. Okay. They can be used for chronic pain conditions when the pain becomes so severe and around the clock that patient's quality of life or function starts to decline. Those are the types of uh, chronic pain conditions that, that do uh, respond uh, to, to opioids. Okay, all right. How do opioids work? Yeah, so opioids are little uh, drugs, little chemicals that act within your central nervous system, so in your brain and also at your spinal cord level, to basically attach to these opioid receptors. And so what those receptors do is they essentially slow down how pain is being sent through your body. And so they're, they're serving as kind of a masking or band-aid device to, to, to stop those pain signals from occurring. Okay, so they really just block the brain's perception of pain. Exactly. Yeah, they're not controlling the pain. Correct. All right, all right. Does someone who is using opioids eventually develop a tolerance and require more and more to achieve the same benefit? They do. So over time, when your body's receptors are constantly activated by those opioids, uh, your, your brain and your nervous system starts to respond less to that because it's so used to having that that chemical within okay. within the nervous system that it, that it starts to uh, starts to uh, develop a tolerance and, and when that happens patients start to escalate require an escalation of doses mm -hmm. essentially more drug to achieve the same effect that they were uh, achieving with those lower doses mm -hmm. and, and so that's the, that's the uh, concept of tolerance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so then we really get into the area of dependence on a drug could you please explain the difference between developing a dependence on a drug and developing an addiction to a drug sure so this is an important distinction it so, is. so dependence is going to be the physical changes that occur uh, after a patient stops a drug. So if you're on a medication for a period of time, your body becomes used to that. And when you stop it, you're gonna have uh, withdrawal symptoms. So those are the physical changes that occur uh, when you discontinue or start to lessen the dose of a drug. That's okay. dependence. That's dependence. Addiction okay. is the uh, harmful kind of compulsive use of a drug despite that medicine or that substance interfering with other aspects of your life. And so this mm -hmm. is kind of more of the uh, dangerous type of uh, phenomenon that develops and so patients that develop an addiction they start to have interference of other aspects of their life their social life their family life their work and so they're starting to compulsively use compulsively use that drug despite the interference of that drug with other aspects of their life. I see, I see. So they're really two different pro processes and they're not synonymous. They are not. And they I think not. I tend to use them synonymously, so I'm really glad to hear that right. distinction. Right, right. Either one is difficult to control. Is this true? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and you know, when you start to develop that dependence, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to get off of the drug and that can ultimately lead to an addiction uh, if it starts to have those interferences with those other aspects mm -hmm. of your life. So do you cut back the drug ever so slightly to yeah, yes. wean someone yeah, off that so drug? Yeah, that, so that, that typically is the best way to do it. If a patient has been on it for a long period of time, you yes. do have to go through a weaning process in order to, in order to get off. Okay, all right. Then if a patient presents a history to you of addiction to other substances, is it advisable to avoid prescribing opioids? Well, it's not an absolute contraindication. Okay. Patients that do have a history of addiction or, or dependence on other substances are at higher risk for developing that same 
those same issues with opioids. Okay. But that doesn't not necessarily mean that it's that they shouldn't they shouldn't be prescribed those. They just need to be closely monitored I see. Uh, in order to in order to avoid them developing into those. So it's situations. really important if a patient comes to you, they are straightforward about their health history and any addictions that they might have so you can help them in the best manner. It is. And and yeah. we and we put patients through a screening process to hopefully tease out or identify some of those issues that have occurred in the past so we can monitor okay. them very That's closely. That's perfect. Wonderful. How does pain management in the senior population, ages 65 and older, get more complicated? Right, right. <laughs> so by nature, the older population tend to develop conditions that cause chronic pain more likely than others. Okay. Those degenerative processes, degenerative disc disease, degenerative arthritis, so they are more likely to have these chronic pain conditions. Managing their pain is more difficult because the older population tends to have other medical comorbidities that also interfere with not just the pain condition but also with the treatments that you're providing. So mm -hmm. those medications, they're a little bit more sensitive to those types of medications. Oh, yes. um, and so you have, to, you have to consider the whole medical history a little bit more uh, thoroughly when it comes to the uh, elderly population than when you do with, with the young. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, if they're on other medications already, that must complicate interactions between meds. It does, and, and, and that's one of the issues with opioids is that there's so many interactions with other medicines, uh, not, just, um, not just the prescribed medications, but even over-the-counter medications, mm -hmm. sleep aids or, or um, substances like alcohol. You know, these types of things have a lot of interference with opioids, and so that's really what you need to be careful yes, of. Yes, yes, um, I understand that. Let's turn our discussion now to focus on the use of opioids in the senior population, both the physical and mm -hmm. mental side effects, and I believe we have a graphic to put on screen as we talk through these points. Sure. So, so with opioids, there's both short-term side effects that happen uh, when you're using the drug for a short period of time, and then there's those long-term adverse effects that happen with persistent use of the opioids. And so the short-term effects include things like nausea, constipation, you can have urinary retention, uh, you can have itching of your skin, you can have decline in your lung function. So those are the short-term side effects that we worry about. Okay. When it comes to more chronic use of opioids, the things we start to get concerned about, especially in the elderly population, is that those opioids can um, slow down your bone. They can, they can mm. cause a decline in your bone health, so they can lead to osteoporosis. Uh, it can lead to dementia or Alzheimer's, um, and it also can, um, you know, decrease your hormones, so decrease sexual function, things like that. So mm -hmm. really both short-term and long-term effects of opioids. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's true. So back to focus on nausea for just a minute, um, or, or really any of these effects. When you start using a new drug, you really should do so carefully and pay attention to how your body is reacting to it because if a senior person falls, that's a whole nother Right. process that you'd rather avoid, right? Yeah, so, th so there's risks and benefits of all these medications, and it's always you have to balance that. What is the risks of the drugs, which we talked about, the nausea, the constipation, the, the potential for falls, mm -hmm. versus what is the benefit? What, is, what are we trying to achieve with these medications? Is it to improve their sleep? Is it to improve their ability to work? Is it to improve their ability to exercise? And so if, if you can justify that they're doing those for a period of time, that can outweigh some of those potential risks. But that said, you still need to continue to pay attention to those risks, because if patients start to develop those side effects, then you can have, you can have significant problems. So it's really a constant evaluation it process. Is. It mm -hmm. is. All right, let's move on to the mental side effects. Do we have a, yeah, there we go. Right, and so, so again, the, these are, these are, a lot of these things are gonna be both short-term and long-term. Okay. So the opioids can, you know, decrease your cognitive function so they can lead to forgetfulness um, and uh, but also they can lead to these more long-term or chronic effects things like dementia they can also uh, interfere with your uh, the emotions of the chemicals in your brain which can lead to depression um, and so again they, they have a lot of effect on your on your thought processes both short-term and also with chronic use all right is it fair to say that we should not just assume that a change in personality of a senior is just a natural sign of aging. We should look at the drugs that they are on, especially if they've been put on a new one. Yeah, so, so when patient, what these drugs do is they actually can consume your thought processes, yes. like I just said. And so they can lead to isolation, uh, they, can they can lead to uh, decreased, you know, uh, potential or propensity for, for, for these older, uh, uh, patients to engage with their peers and so they really start to isolate themselves and these changes in behavior you you can't just 
say are, are due to you know routine aging they can actually right. do be due to the effects of the drugs right right well I think that's a very important point to to make um, it's also important then to recognize warning signs of opioid abuse in an er elderly person let's look at some of the signs of the opioid abuse right so again this this is when when, when you start to see opioid abuse, this is where you start to have those effects, those interferences with your other aspects of your life. So the drug starts to be used for other reasons. Maybe it's to curb some of their anxiety. Maybe it's to help them with their sleep. Um, using a drug longer than we would typically use it for. You know, those types of behaviors, you start to say, well, they're starting to develop those compulsive types of uh, behaviors that are more concerning, and, and that happens with more, more long-term use, um, uh, leads to social withdrawal, reckless behaviors, you know, the list, the list that you have in front of you there. Um, and, and so those are, those are warning signs to really pay attention to, specifically in that older population, um, and, 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 and try to mitigate those, those concerns. And if a patient uh, tries not to take the drug, but withdrawal symptoms happen, what, what might some withdrawal symptoms be that would be noticeable. Yeah. So, so think of withdrawal as the worst flu of your life. So okay. you're going to have uh, diffuse body aches. So your entire body is going to hurt. You're going to have you, diarrhea. You can have nausea. You can have um, anxiety, increased anxiety. You have difficulty sleeping. Uh, you start to sweat more. Oh, gosh. Uh, so it really is kind of feeling like your body is going through a, a, a terrible flu. Okay. All right. Well, we should pay attention to that. Dr. Zock, we will be displaying a website for our viewers to access that addresses a number of is issues, one of them being the opioid crisis among seniors. And as we do that, I would like to have you address one last question. What do you see coming in the future in terms of pain management? Yeah, so, so I think the, the future of pain management is actually quite bright. Historically, we really only had one tool in our toolbox. It was opioids. Ah. And while they, we, while they worked for a while, we've, we've, we've started to identify the problem that has occurred with the opioid epidemic. The future of pain management is going to focus more on non-medication types of treatments, interventional treatments, a treatment called spinal cord stimulation or neuromodulation where we can actually implant devices into patients and kind of mask how pain is being perceived really? through the nervous system. So uh, in my opinion, I think the, the future of, of, of pain management is quite bright and, and we have a more of a breadth of, of options to treat and manage pain. All right. That's a very encouraging and optimistic view of the future of pain management. Dr. Zock, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your expertise. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And please remember, it's never too late to live and learn.